uh, Mark Kimsey. I am a research staff with the Intermountain Forestry Cooperative based in Moscow, Idaho at the University of Idaho. So kind of on the competitor's turf over here somewhat, so to speak, but we're not. We're collaborators. We work a lot with Peter Kolb and uh, a lot of the work they're doing over here is great. We're just uh, happy to have an opportunity to, to collaborate with them and be here and talk with you guys today. A lot of the work we do is soils based. Um, you know, trees have to grow in something, right? So, and uh, our soils are not like egg soils. Egg soils are pretty uniform where they grow their egg crops. Whereas in forestry, we have a lot of different soils we have to work with and all of them have different properties. And so today, I just want to kind of cover some of what that means from a forestry perspective. So kind of on uh, this slide here, you know, right here, how many of you been to Crater Lake, Oregon? Yeah, so a lot of you know where that's at. Um, that actually has a huge role to play, actually, in a lot of our forests in this region. And uh, we'll talk about that. In fact, it's very critical in some of our forest systems in this area. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about is soils in the Intermountain Northwest, uh, their role in forest health, productivity management, and a lot of the material I'm going to present today, um, I've kind of come into this after a lot of this work was done. Uh, the bulk of this work was done by Terry Shaw, Peter Micah, Mary Ann Johnston, and Jim Moore. Um, they were kind of the originals with the uh, Intermountain Forest Tree Nutrition Cooperative. Um, now known as Intermount Forest Cooperative, and a lot of this work was done by them, so I want to give them the credit for what I'm going to present today. So, a little overview of where we're going to go. Essentially, I'm just going to kind of set the table, give you a little background of why we need to know what we know, how we got to this point. Um, before we dive into soils, we have to understand a little bit about the nutritional ecology of our conifer species in this region. You know, what do they need? because um, that's really uh, what drives their response to the parent material, the soil parent material that they, they grow on. So then we'll dive into some of the physical and the chemical characteristics of these different soils and rocks of the region. And then we'll tie it all together, kind of the effects of climate and soils and fertilization on, on conifer health and productivity. And then if we have time at the end, we'll talk about some of the kind of the best management practices that we can have to to make sure that uh, we conserve the, the sustainability and the productivity of our forests. Because at the end of the day, you know, what's, what's our goal? Our management goal is to have a forest that's productive, healthy, and can sustain long-term production for our, for our needs, whether they be for, you know, um, harvest, whether they be for wildlife habitat, you know, it really doesn't matter. You know, healthy and resilient forests can meet anyone's particular management objectives, whatever those be. So let's just kind of set the table a little bit of background. You know, what are the, there's just a couple of main drivers of forest productivity that, you know, and that's intuitively we all know that, right? Everything needs light, needs water, uh, needs uh, appropriate temperature for whatever particular conifer species that uh, is uh, uh, growing on a site, uh, and then nutrients. You know, just like us, uh, we need water, we need nutrients, um, so does trees, right? So that all makes sense. So everything has different needs and we need to understand that. And so anything we do from a management perspective on the ground, we have to work within the context of site. So every site, depending on what your latitude is, depending on what your elevation is, you know, you're gonna have different kinds of light regimes you know, aspect, you know, so you have different light aspects, you have different temperature aspects, you have different moisture aspects. But what we can affect is actually the nutrition on the ground because essentially your plants are taking up the nutrients from the ground. And so what you do with those plants, what you do with those trees, has an impact on the nutrient capital of that site. So if you're on a poor nutrient site and you're taking harvests, you're, you're harvesting crops, you have the ability to take nutrients off that site. So what's the replacement rate? How long does it take for that site to recover from the nutrients you take off? Some sites are very resilient. You can do annual har or you can do your harvest regimes and you'll actually be able to, you won't have to worry about site nutrient capital. On other sites, you have to be concerned. And so we're gonna talk about that as we go through. So all this means that as we manage, nutri uh, managing nutrition is really managing forest productivity. 
what we do with our forest crops are going to have effect long term. And we've all seen aspects of this. Um, you know, one aspect you can see is, is uh, in places where they're harvesting to the point where it's not sustainable on that site and it gets converted over to grasslands, right? So you're losing some productivity. So managing site, we have the ability to maintain the productivity of that site, or we also have the, man uh, the ability to actually degrade it. And so it's really critical to look at the time horizon of what your management objectives are. And while your current harvest <coughs> regime may not, or whatever your management regime is on that landscape, in the short term, um, it also has a long-term consequence. And so we have to be thoughtful of, okay, this is what our needs are now, what's our needs in the future as well? And how can we get there and maintain that site productivity? So this is important not only for, for maintaining site productivity, but a lot of our organizations, and, and I'm not sure from a kind of a, a NIPF perspective, but you know, for certification, maintaining that site productivity, site quality, that's important. A lot of work was done back in the 1960s and 70s, and um, Scanlon, Lowenstein, and uh, Pitkin did a lot of work back then looking at what was limiting forest productivity in this, in this region. And this graph is a little hard to see, it's, it's kind of a small graph, but if you have a chance, I think they're recording this and you'll have it, I think they'll be able to give you this PowerPoint slideshow, I, I hope you can get access to it. But there was a paper written in 1979 by Scanlon and Lowenstein where they looked at thinning and fertilization regimes. A lot of work had been done on the west side looking at response to nitrogen fertilization because a lot of the west side forests were looking at trying to ramp up production. They were wanting to look at nitrogen limitations in their forests and they recognized that nitrogen, and we're going to see this in a minute, is one of the most limiting nutrients in the region. So they said, okay, if we put more nitrogen out there, we should grow faster and bigger forests, right? Well, they brought that same study design over onto the east side. And while they got somewhat similar responses, in other words, if we put nitrogen out, so what we're looking at here is a, is a, um, a fertilization is this first set of bell curves, a thinning regime that is a second set of bell curves, and then the third is a thin, thinning and fertilization regime. This was for Douglas fir, this was for Grand fir. And what you can see from this is, uh, and then percent response, the top one is basal area response, the second one's height response, and the, the bottom one's volume response. So let's just look at volume response. You know, there's an additive effect of thinning and fertilization. Typically, some level of, of fertilization or thinning had a positive increase in, in growth. But what they saw was there was a fairly wide distribution of responses to this, these different subcultural regimes. And they were wondering, why do we have such a wide range in response? You know, other, from negative responses to actually very, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent responses to either thinning and fertilization. So it was just like, why? Why are we doing this? Well, when it comes into their experimental designs, whoops, getting ahead of myself. If you read that paper, they'll say, you know, we recognize that soils are important. We recognize that climate's important but they weren't able to capture those effects in this particular study. A lot of those effects of soil parent material and climate were confounded with where they selected sites. And so it was really no surprise that they, they, they got this response. So out of that came the Intermountain Forest Tree Nutrition Cooperative in 1980. And now known as the Intermountain Forestry Cooperative, but it was a group of forest management organizations, both public you know, Forest Service, BLM, Washington DNR, Idaho Department of Lands, and back in those early days, um, Montana DNR was also involved in this project. We also had a group of, of uh, small to mid to large private timber holding companies, and they said, we need to find out what's going on in our forest, because what we're bringing, what we're importing from the west side is not working on the east side. Why do you think that is? Moisture, yeah. If you have a lot of moisture, it can overcome a lot of other issues in your forest because if you have water, 
you're doing good. But over here, we're drier, and our soil parent material is considerably more diverse than what they even have on the west side. As I said, we need to understand what's going on on this, these sites. So this is the kind of the yellow dots here are the uh, hmm, dot. No, it's, it's dying. Maybe they've got another one here. There we go. So what we've done over the last several decades, um, basically almost 35, 36 years now, we've installed nutrition trials, productivity trials, all across the drier interior northwest, from east slopes of the Cascades, all the way over here into to northwestern Montana. And with that, we had to come up with, okay, if we're going to do this research to try to define site and what it means to us from a forest health and forest productivity perspective, we have to ensure that our designs of our experiments are adequate to capture the variability on the landscape. Otherwise, we can put all the money and work we want into this and everything we get out is meaningless. You know? We have to make sure we do this appropriate. So, in the early studies, it clearly indicated that there was, there was a significant impact of soil and climate. It was just that it was confounding. So we had no clear focus or um, guidance on where we needed to go with this. And, you know, when you think about 1980, right, no smartphones, no tablets, no real computers, GIS capabilities. No, we had to do it the good old way, right? We had to let sight tell us what's going on. And so we had to bin up our sites. And so for climate, what do you think the most, uh, most basic way of doing it and a very accurate way of doing it? Habitat type, right? Let the plant species tell you what's going on on, on these sites. You know, Pfister, um, back in the 70s, put together this forest habitat types in Montana. Not sure if many of you are aware of this. Here's a kind of link where you can go to, to get this publication. But what this allows you to do is it classifies sites based on overstory species, which gives you the macro climate. What's the air temperature and, and mean, mean annual temperature regimes, mean annual precipitation regimes. And what these overstory uh, species, which would be ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, grand fir, cedar, and then in the hemlock. Essentially, this is a gradation of your macroclimate, what we call macroclimate. And so we can start bidding up sites based on these different types of overstory species. So we can say, okay, well, we know if we're in this Doug fir pine type, we're going to be in drier, warmer habitats. If we're in our grand fir types, Typically, those sites are going to be more moist, a little more cooler. And then we get into our cedar <coughs> hemlock, it's going to be cooler and a lot wetter. You know, we've, we've all driven through these systems, so it, it, intuitively it makes sense, right? So we can start using this type of system to say, okay, we're going to make sure we get a range of sites that go from our dry to our moist to our wet sites. So now we can, we can put in our research sites across a spectrum of habitat types. And I'll wait if you're, you guys want to write that pub down, I'll wait on that link real quick so you guys can write that down because it's a, it's a great document to have. So now we're able to capture site climate with these types of inputs. Okay, from a nutrition perspective, what do we want to do? Back in the 1980s, a lot of the soil survey information was spotty. It didn't have the spatial um, spread of information that we needed for doing our work. And so we thought, well, soils have to come from something, right? <laughs> they got to come from rocks. And so we used a lot of the material uh, developed by Montana DNR, uh, Montana Bureau of Mines and uh, they put together a lot of these geology layers. We used the Idaho Geologic Survey, different states, you know, Washington had their own geologic survey, Oregon has their own geologic survey, and so we're able to piece all this together. And working with geologists, then, we're able to say, okay, on these particular sites, these are the rock types we have. We're going to talk about these different rock types that we have, but there's some broad categories of rock types we have in this region. A lot of different flavors within those, but we have our metasedimentary rocks, we have sedimentary, 
granitics, basalts, and, and a lot of glacial deposits. And all of them have very different properties. So I'm going to talk about each of those a little bit more individually in a little bit. We also have considerable amount of surficial deposits. And when we call about a surficial deposit, that geologists, when you look at a geology map, they consider this overburden. They just say that's just yeah, that's not important for their mapping perspectives. So, and it's only because it's less than five, you know, if it's five, at less than 10 feet deep, they don't even think about it from a geology perspective. And it only makes sense. They want to get that basement down there. But where's the tree roots? You know, the tree roots, if, if you have a soil weathered from one of these pair of materials, it's going to be sitting in that. But if you have a surficial deposit of alluvial loss or volcanic ash sitting over the top of these, and it's deep, well, what's, being, what's driving that is, is these surficial deposits. So we have to be aware of that. So whenever we would go and select a site based on geology, we also had to be aware of that surficial deposit category <coughs> and make sure we weren't, being conf we weren't confounding the effects of this with our geology. And that's critical, as you'll see in a little bit. So that's the background. That kind of sets the table of where we needed to go with how we can start setting up our experiments to start to define this. So the first step after doing, or the second step after doing our kind of binning up of our sites is we have to get a handle on what are the, what's the nutrient ecology? In other words, what is the nutrient requirements that our species need? Every tree is going to be different. Every tree has a different nutrient requirement. So we need to understand that. In all plants, all plants have, and you've probably all heard about macronutrients and micronutrients and, and, and which ones are plant essential. And so from a tree perspective, what we're looking at here is kind of a short list of those macro and micronutrients that are really critical in forest health. And so this is kind of a table of their function, uh, within, what, what that nutrient function is within a tree, and also where they get the source. And so first off, nitrogen. Why is nitrogen important? It's very critical in photosynthetic activity, which is the driver of, of what makes a tree grow, and biomass production. So the, if a tree is deficient in nitrogen, you know, it's not going to grow as well. In the Northwest, we have a problem from a nitrogen perspective because the dominant source of our nitrogen comes from the atmosphere, being fixed by nitrifying species. If you don't have a lot of nitrifying species, you're not going to get a lot of nitrogen inputs into your soils. So our atmospheric deposition rates and, and fixing rates are fairly low in this region. And so, as you're going to see in a minute, it's no wonder that a lot of our stands are going to be deficient in nitrogen. When we get into some of the other nutrients, like phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, copper, and boron, a lot of these actually come from the soil parent material. They weather from minerals. And so they're going to be less deficient. Where they become deficient is, is your rock deficient in that nutrient to the degree that a particular species, it might affect a particular tree species. So some rocks are very high in potassium. You know, granitics have what they call a potassium feldspar mineral. So by that name, if it says potassium feldspar, you can imagine that as that potassium feldspar weathers, that site's going to have a lot of potassium, right? So on these particular sites, um, particularly in our igneous rocks like basalts and granites, we're not going to have a potassium issue. Phosphorus is fairly um, not even hardly deficient. Sometimes we see some deficiencies on some glacial soils. Sulfur we can get both from rock and from the atmosphere. Copper is primarily rock. We see some deficiencies in copper, um, particularly if we get into like alluvial deposits, something that's been really weathered and transported, something that's really been weathered to the point that a lot of those primary minerals have been weathered and, and, and are gone. And boron, while we get some amount from a rock, we often see this as actually limiting. And part of the reason for that is there's very minimal amounts of boron in our rocks. And so there's a very tight cycling between 
the organic matter which contains the boron that the trees have mined and then you get the litter and the dye in the the dieback of the trees and it drops the needles, it drops branches and then the microbes decompose that and that's released back in the system. It, as immediately as a boron becomes available, the plants take it right back up just because it's so limiting. And so while we get a little bit from a rock, a lot of this is just from internal cycling of your organic matter. So when we get into best management practices at the end of this talk, we're going to see why it's really critical for things like boron that you really are aware of your organic litter that sits on your soil. So when you're doing management activities, a lot of times when you're doing piling and burning on your forest lands, it's really easy to scrape that top litter off and actually expose and actually scrape some maybe that top mineral soil. That just happens to be where all that boron recycling happens. So if you move that off that site, that's going to have some bad influences on future nutrition on that particular site. So what does this mean from a conifer perspective? Every tree has a different degree of nutrient requirements. At the top of our nutrient requirement list is our firs. Our grand fir and our Douglas fir have very high nutrient requirements. In the middle, in our pine species, somewhat low to moderate, to, uh, low to high. White pine typically a little higher. Our five needle pine typically has a higher nutrient requirement. Our ponderosa pine is more moderate and our lodgepole pine is very low. When you get in these pine species they're very efficient with the nutrient uptake. Very efficient. Um, they also have a much slower growing rate <coughs> compared to some of your fir species. And so they're very conservative with their nutrients. Western larch tends to be low and also our hemlock tends to be low. Western larch is very conservative with nutrient uptake. Um, you know, it's one of our cereal species. It kind of inhabits those sites that are, are disturbed, like through fire. Um, West, we really, for all, those of us over in Idaho, we really envy you guys of your larch stands. We really do. Uh, we love coming over and working in them because they're special. I mean, you guys are unique for your western larch forests in this region. But western larch is also still somewhat of an unknown as far as how it responds because it's just a weird egg when it comes to forests and trees because it's a deciduous conifer, right? It's, it's, a very, it's kind of a throwback, so to speak. And so we'll do treatments over here in Montana and we'll get a completely different response in larch over in Idaho and Northeast Washington. So not only is there a species differences about nutrient requirements, there's also a regional effect. And we're still trying to get a handle on March. But typically, if you want to do a ranking, when you're thinking about nutrient requirements, <coughs> your firs are on the top, your pines are in your middle, and your, your larches and your hemlocks are in the, in, at the bottom. And just to give an illustration of the amount of nutrients actually held above ground, in a couple different species, in our, especially our high nutrient species. We're looking at Douglas fir and grain fir. And three of the more, uh, three of the highest loadings of, of, of nutrients in our, in our above ground are nitrogen, potassium, and calcium. And this is in pounds per acre above ground. So that's going to be in the stem wood, it's going to be in the bark, it's going to be in the branches, it's going to be in the needles. And so on a typical uh, in a typical Douglas fir stand, you could be carrying up to around 400 pounds of nitrogen to the acre. It's a lot of nitrogen. In fact, a lot of uh, fertilization, uh, fertilization regimes recommend fertilizing with about 200 pounds of nitrogen to the acre in our forest. So you can tell right off the bat that if you have around 400 pounds above ground, that's a significant amount of nitrogen that's being held. So what does that mean when you're doing harvesting? If you're pulling all the tops and limbs and bowls off the site and you're, you're taking all the forest harvest residue and putting it all into a pile and burning it, you're taking a lot of nitrogen off that site, right? Especially if it's a limiting site that's really limiting on your stands. And so this can be, have an impact. Potassium has a, uh, around three, 200, a little over 200 to a little over 300 depending on your species of uh, pounds per acre of, of potassium on the ground. Calcium is, is much higher, particularly for granfer. Uh, 
up to 600 pounds per acre calcium. Now that makes sense, right? Calcium is what? It's used for structure in your, in your, in your trees. And so it's no surprise that you're going to see a lot more calcium above ground in your plant species, particularly in grand fir. And now while calcium might, you see, while you might see a lot of calcium above ground, a lot of your, you very rarely see a calcium deficiency, and that's because there's a lot of calcium actually in the soil. So it's much less of an issue that you would have than when you compare it to nitrogen. So for us to start to understand where our species sit as far as nutrition needs in our forest, we have to have different ways of assessing it. One of the ways of doing it is to get a distribution of nutrient levels in our existing stands. And if we can do that across the region, we can start to understand, okay, what is the typical level of nutrition in our forest? What for a particular nutrient? This allows us to say, okay, we're here in Missoula, Montana, and we do a nutrient assessment on nitrogen content in and we usually use foliage for this. Foliage is a great diagnostic of <coughs> nutrient deficiencies. So we can say, okay, we have 0.8, That's and we'll get into what these numbers mean in a little bit, whereas a critical level, which is here, is 1.2. Okay, that says, okay, we're deficient on that part stand. So we can use our distribution curves of where our nutrients are across the region, compare them to our nutrient critical levels, which is, that's the minimum amount necessary for that tree to grow in a healthy, resilient manner. If you fall below that, it's going to be susceptible to poor growth, insects, and disease attacks. And we can also go out and do some fertilization and see how it responds. If it doesn't respond to a nutrient, it has plenty of it, right? If, so if you put nitrogen out, and you do not see a growth response or a nutrient response in the needles, it didn't need nitrogen fertilization. If you see a significant response to it, it needed it. So it's just kind of a, a, a very quick and dirty way of, of, of looking at that. So I mentioned two things, distribution curves and critical levels. So let's look at four species of this region that we often work with. Grand fir, Doug fir, lodgepole pine, and ponderosa pine. Remember that critical level I told you. Critical levels are if the foliage concentrations of that particular element fall below one of these values, then that site is deficient in that particular nutrient. So in this case, we're looking at nitrogen concentration and here for, this would be the nitrogen critical levels for each species, and they all differ. These curves represent all the four stands we tested for nitrogen, for ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, lodgepole, and grand fir. <coughs> so our four stands ranged from about 0.7% concentration of nitrogen all the way up to 1.7, well, actually, yeah, 1.7% concentration in the foliage. So there is this wide distribution of nitrogen in our forest stands, depending on the species, and they all differed by species. So let's just say we went out and sampled a Douglas fir, we ground up its foliage, we extracted nitrogen, and we came up with a 1% nitrogen content in that foliage. So if we come here at 1%, we come up to our curve for Douglas fir, which is the dashed yellow line, it comes in right around a little over 0.2 on this cumulative frequency diagram. What this means is that 20% of our forest stands in this region would fall into that, that category. So 20% of our stands have about 1% nitrogen. In them. So it gives you an idea of where that stand, that Douglas fir, sits relative to the entire region. But let's just say it did come in at 1%. It just so happens for Douglas fir, the critical level is 1.4% all the way out here. That means the minute that your Doug fir nitrogen concentration in your foliage drops below 1.4%, you've got problems for nitrogen. Well, just look at our cumulative distribution curve 
across the region for Douglas fir. If you draw this line across, this means 95% of your stands are deficient in nitrogen across this region. So that's how you can read that graphic. So if there's any questions while we're going through this, yeah, please ask, please I, ask I'm away. I'm terrible at reading graphs. So um, our critical level is 1.4. Yep. And so you, that's what we don't, we want it above that. Right. So if your critical level is below that, then you're deficient in nitrogen. So what that means then is you're going to have reduced productivity from a growth perspective. Um, might not necessarily mean you're going to have a health issue. It's just it means that site's not going to be as productive as it possibly can. One of the things we have to be careful with in nitrogen, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, is say you do come up with a nitrogen deficiency. On certain rock types, if you put fertilizer of just nitrogen out, you can actually kill trees. And the reason for that being is, is Liebig, it's Liebig's barrel. Remember, if you have one that's really deficient and you fill that gap, but there was another one that was deficient and you don't fill that gap, you could create nutrient imbalances. And what happens is, is insects and disease love trees that are stressed, right? So, if that tree is struggling along, doing the best it can with what it has, and then you come and fill that barrel and say, okay, that's all I needed. That's all I need to do is fill that particular slat in the barrel to get nitrogen back above our critical levels. If that site's deficient in sulfur or potassium or some of these other more defensive chemicals, you can actually create an imbalance in your tree from a nutrient perspective. And you can also create an imbalance in your sugar to phenol ratios. And the, re and the reason, uh, I'll just say this, if your sugar content in your tree is higher than your phenols, which is your defense chemicals, root rots love sugars, right? They love them. And so you can actually increase the susceptibility of that tree by creating a too high of a sugar content in those trees. Bugs. Bugs love trees with lots of sugar. It's just like us. I mean, hey, we like our sugar, right? What happens when we eat a lot of sugar, right? We get sick. Same thing with a tree. You give a tree too much sugar, it'll get sick too if it's not kept in balance. And it all comes back to soil parent material. Some soil parent materials have enough of those other nutrients in them that when you overcome the nitrogen deficiency, you're fine. Some soil parent materials don't have those critical nutrients to keep that balance, those ratios in play. And that's where the problems come in. So we're going to dive into that too a little bit later. So that was nitrogen. On the opposite side of the spectrum is potassium. Remember I said a lot of rocks, have, a lot of our minerals for, uh, in rocks have potassium in them, potassium feldspars primarily. And so, as you can see, looking at a cumulative distribution curve and our critical levels, our critical levels all hover right around between 0.5 and 0.6% concentration of potassium in the foliage, which comes down into here. This means that if you look at these critical levels, the highest was at 0.6, which comes in at about 0 0.23, 0 0.24. So let's just say at 0.25. The majority of our stands are not deficient in potassium. So, you know, here's 100% of our forest stands out here. Here's 0% of our forest stands here. So most of those critical deficiency levels fall right down in here, which means that 90, on the average, 90% of our stands, other than this Douglas fir, are going to be fine for potassium. Potassium is very important. If are you going to, anybody going to go to see Peter Kolb's talk in the second session? So if you do, they're going to talk about drought. What does potassium do? I'm going to go back to a slide real quick. Oops, I'm going forward. Potassium is stomatal control. So that's how a tree breathes. That's the whole evapotranspiration pathway that allows trees to suck water and nutrients up out of the ground, 
it releases the moisture, it intakes carbon dioxide, or it takes in carbon dioxide, and that's the whole pathway of how a tree functions is through the stomates in the foliage. If it doesn't have enough potassium, if it's deficient in potassium, what's going to happen is those stomates are not going to function properly. So consider drought conditions. So why, let's just say a site, uh, a region has gone through maybe a kind of a moist period. A lot of grand fir comes into the understory. It really takes over. Maybe it was traditionally a dug fir type. And you get all that grand fir coming up underneath of it. And then all of a sudden what happens? Like we've been having, drought comes in, right? And all of a sudden you see all those grand fir starting to die off, okay? Grand fir loves to keep its stomates open. So in droughty conditions, not only does it love to keep it open, but if it's deficient in this potassium, it's not going to be able to regulate it. Stomates can close it, saying, "Oh, I've got it. I'm not. Uh, this is not a nutrient deficiency issue. This is a water deficiency issue. I don't have enough water. But if it's not going to be closing and opening its stomates appropriately, what's going to happen? It's going to die because it's pumping the water out of the ground. It's pumping it out of the tree and it's not closing them to hold on to that water. And so that's why a lot of times you see your grand fir kick out." in your drier sites after a moist period of time that hits drought periods is because it loves to keep its stomates open. So for other species, if there's a potassium deficiency and there's drought stress, that's a double whammy for those particular species because they're not going to be able to handle any kind of drought conditions that get thrown at it. Yeah. So is, is the would this be an overgeneralization if, I, if I'm thinking that, okay, your drought-tolerant species are the ones that have better stomatal control? Think ponderosa pine, some of the best stomato controls compared to your climax. And, and the reason why is they have to be efficient and conservative with water. So they're going to be very tight with their, their um, evapotranspiration pathway. So if they hit that environment, that's why ponderosa pine sometimes shuts down growth in July. Whereas a lot of other species, they try to grow all the way into August if the conditions are right. Ponderosa pine, it will stop. If the conditions are right, it will stop just growing. It'll just sit there. Very efficient. So a lot of your cereal species, cereal being more of your dry, low elevation species, are going to be more efficient with their water or their stomata control. Your climax species, they don't have to worry about water. Why is that? Climax species being cedar, hemlock, and it, grand fir be as it fades into the cedar hemlock types. Typically, water's not as important to them because they're growing there because there's adequate moisture on those sites already. So if we get droughty conditions like Peter's going to talk about later, what's going to happen to those moisture-loving species? They're not going to have that stomato control capabilities to shut down in droughty conditions. So they keep pumping, and they're, they're basically they're pumping themselves to death. And so if you acerbate that with a potassium deficiency, which doesn't always happen, as, as you can see here, it's not going to be as critical, but it could be a double whammy. So what we tell our collaborators and the folks we work for, that if you want to try to determine what's going on on your site, we just ask them to send us foliage. And we can then use our nutrient distribution curves to see, one, is it deficient in a certain nutrient? If so, will it respond to fertilization? Does it call for more extensive nutrition conservation measures in your management plans? Um, because if we have a location, if we can tag it with a, um, a coordinate, and we've got the nutrition information off that. We can look at your soil parent material. We know what the climate is. We know what its deficiencies are. We can pretty much tell what's going to happen on that particular site. So what you need to do for management to either conserve or if you need to act, actually add some additional nutrients to that site. Because certain rock types, you don't want to put just nitrogen out. Even though nitrogen may be the most efficient, you want to put other nutrients out to maintain those nutritional balances. So we also can tell you how many you need to actually do for, uh, collect to establish that. So let's just summarize this from a nutrient ecology perspective. 
Nitrogen in our forest stands are going to 95 to 99% of the time be limiting. Potassium, sometimes. A lot of our metasedimentary rocks are where we start to see potassium deficiencies. Our igneous rocks, basalts, granitics, typically you do not. Sulfur, common deficiency. Um, unless you're sitting on some sort of a gypsum, like when you get near Yellowstone, down in that country, you get a lot of these sedimentary rocks that contain sulfur. A lot of this region, not so much. So actually, nitrogen and sulfur tend to be the two that are the most limiting for many of our common species in this region, primarily because sulfur and rocks are, you have to be in certain kind of rock types. Yellowstone is just rife with lots of rocks. Um, sulfur. But are we managing, from our perspective, are we managing trees in Yellowstone? Now, for the Park Service or for the Forest Service, yes. But as a private landowner, most often than not, um, sulfur is not going to be something that we're going to see a, a huge amount. So the other source of sulfur is the atmosphere. And just like nitrogen, we don't get a lot of sulfur deposition from the atmosphere. We just don't. We don't have a lot of volcanic activity at this time. Uh, we don't have industry that's putting out the you know the chemicals that you know put sulfur in the atmosphere so from that perspective our sulfur uh, deposition is fairly low and then like I mentioned boron because there's so little in it that once it's released from organic matter cycling it typically is limiting as well so NKSB are the four biggies in this region as far as nutrient limitations and really nitrogen sulfur and boron are the most common. Okay, so that sets the table now of where our trees sit. So now let's dive into what kind of rocks we have in this region and what this means from a chemical and physical perspective. So all soil comes from rocks. Just depends on how it got there, you know? So Primary, the primary source of rocks are what we call igneous rocks. These are rocks from magma that's been heated deep in the Earth's crust and either have been exposed through erosion or have been through like lava flows. That molten magma comes to the surface and it flows out, crystallizes, creates a, a, a kind of a mantle of that particular rock on the surface. Typically we call that basalt. And all of those have different weathering patterns, nutritional characteristics, uh, physical characteristics. So basically all soils come from igneous rocks. Now what happens to those igneous rocks? They're weathered, they're eroded, they're transported, they're buried, they're metamorphosed. All sorts of things happen to igneous rocks so that you can either get sedimentary rocks, which is just weathered and transported materials, they can be consolidated, and this is what we call uh, shale, sandstone, siltstone, claystone. Actually, in this region, you have a lot of sedimentary rocks. There are your um, dolomites, your limestones. Those are a lot of sedimentary rocks that you have in this region. If we call it unconsolidated, this is your glacial till, your alluviums. Um, you know, the, what do they call it, the Laurentian ice sheet that came down out of Canada, ground its way through this northern tier of the states, and left behind a lot of glacial material, outwash as we call it. This is one of the hardest parent, soil parent materials to really diagnose, because why? As those big glaciers came grinding down out of Canada, they carried with it a lot of parent, soil parent material, geology, rock types, they were from very many different sources. Could have been from granitic sources. It could have been from metamorphosed sedimentary rocks. It could have been from granitics. It could have been from basalts. It's just a hodgepodge. In fact, when you look at a glacial till soil, which you have a lot of around here, you'll see different colors. You'll see different texture types. You'll see coarser grain. You'll see finer grain. All of that is just a different source of rock, all with its different nutritional characteristics, all with its different weathering rates. And so you can imagine the challenge when you get into a hodgepodge of soils made up of glacial till, sometimes you really don't know what you've got. <laughs>
So as we go into the metamorphic rocks, these are what I just call pressure cooked rocks. So essentially they're, they're either some of our igneous rocks, particularly granitics that are in the Earth's crust that due to some sort of tectonic activity, just think of that, as you've got that rock sitting in that crust and you've got plates grinding against each other and uplifting and moving, that's going to deform rocks. That's just what we call metamorphos. It's just changing that original structure of the parent rock. And so with that pressure also comes what we call cooking. Cooking, if you have a rock high in silica content, SiO2, which is just glass, imagine what happens when you take, you know, when you, somebody makes glass figures, what do they use? They use a lot of heat, right? So you can imagine a metamorphosed position or a, me a, metamorphic pos a metamorphosing position deep in the Earth's crust. Not only do you have that grinding and uh, kind of the physical pressure, you also have a lot of heat. And that heat changes that silica. It heats it up and transforms it into secondary types of minerals. A lot of our metamorphic rocks are harder than their parent material rocks. Because you can imagine what happens when you take that glass and you melt it and then it refreezes again. It just makes it a lot harder, makes it more resistant to weathering, which makes a big difference when it comes to weathering rates. Same thing can happen with our sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks like our limestones and our dolomites, <coughs> um, our sandstones, if you do the same thing to it, metamorphose them, oftentimes they weather much more slowly, they form very shallow soils, they're very poor from a nutrition perspective too because sedimentary rocks have been weathered from their parent material rocks, they've been transported, buried, cooked, smushed, uplifted, weathered again. So can you imagine from a nutrition perspective, that's like our processed foods. You have your real foods, whole foods, right out of your garden, right? <coughs> so you can actually look at your metasedimentary rocks often as processed foods, and you can look at your igneous rocks as whole foods from a tree perspective. And actually, that's, you can take that to the bank. And there's different ways you can determine this in the field. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And then, of course, we have to be aware of our surficial depart, uh, deposit environment because all of that plays a significant role in what your trees are seeing from a nutrition. If you're in an alluvium, lacustrine environment, think of that again. A lot of this alluvium and lacustrine is material that's weathered from weathered material. So you can imagine from a nutritional perspective, they're going to be pretty low, right? Um, they've gone through all these different stages to where they finally have been exposed again. So oftentimes we get into these, particularly in our lacustrine environment, and they're fairly poor. Uh, one of our foresters over in Idaho, he called this material, you see some of this when you go west out of Missoula on I-90. You see those deep beds, they're just kind of almost kind of like a grayish white. Those are all the custard deposits. He called it loon goo. And the reason why he called it loon goo is whenever you drove on it, it just got all over your equipment, it got white, it got it like clay, it's very fine textured. And so on this, these kind of soils, they're challenging from a nutrition perspective. One of the biggest that we have in this region is our volcanic ash. Less so for you guys here in western Montana for less, unless you got way out into the prairie. But from a forestry perspective, we have to deal with this in Idaho because we have that Palouse Basin with all those Columbia River basalt flows that we have out there that we'd have all those lust deposits. The wind dunes created from the retreat of the glaciers blew all that fine material and created all that lust over our region. You guys didn't get it to the degree we did. But we all are affected here by volcanic ash. So geologists roll their eyes when we talk about good rocks, bad <coughs> rocks. In fact, when we say that, they get a little um, kind of perturbed and they say, well, is there a good tree and a bad tree? Well, so of course there is. But, <laughs> but you know, we've, Jim Moore, the original director of the Tree Nutrition Co-op, coined this term, good rocks, bad rocks. And essentially all this means is, does your rock type have the proper nutritional balance in it, in its geochemical makeup, that one, allows it to develop a profile, and is it capable of supplying and holding on to those nutrients for your trees? Why is this important, developing a soil profile? 
I'm going to ask that question. Why do you why do you want to develop a soul profile? And what would be some properties of that soul profile you think would be advantageous from a tree tree health and productivity perspective? Organic matter buildup. Organic matter buildup. Your rooting volume needs something to root to. Yeah, yeah. And the nutrients. The nutrients. Water. And water. Water in this dry interior northwest, water, water, water. Nutrients are important. If you don't have water, though, it doesn't really matter, right? So if your rocks are made up of minerals that don't weather well, if they do weather, they form really coarse textured soils or shallow soils or soils with a high coarse fraction, gravel content, can you imagine what that means from a water holding capacity and from a nutrient perspective? The shallower your soils, the coarser your soils, the more limiting it is not only from a nutrition perspective but from a water holding perspective which is critical in this region. If you have a coarse textured soil, what does that mean? It means that you have large minerals, you have large particles. Think of granitic soils. Have you all been on some granite type soils, the really coarse textured sandy type soils? It doesn't have a lot of what we call surface area. <coughs> it doesn't have what we call exchange sites as to the degree that clay, get on some basalt soils, right? It gets all over everything. You can't get it off. Why is that? It's because it has a lot of surface area. When something has a lot of surface area, it has what we call exchange sites. Exchange sites mean it has the ability to hold on to plant essential nutrients. If it doesn't have that, you're not going to be able to hold on to your nutrients. It's going to have less nutrients, it's going to have a shallower soil profile, and it's going to have less water holding capacity. So if you take a tree growing on a basalt soil versus a granitic soil, it's going to be more advantageous on the basalt soil than it is on the granitic soil in the same climatic regime. You could take a tree growing on a basalt soil at 2,000 feet and a tree growing on granitic soil at 4,500 feet and I guarantee you that same tree at 4,500 feet on a coarse texture soil will grow better than the tree on the basalt soil even though the nutrition is better. Why is that? Why? Water. Exactly. So we have to keep all that in mind when we're looking through our sites, what we're working with. So we have to use both the chemical content and weathering components to you know, classify this good rocks, bad rocks. From a soil perspective, you know, as depending, and we just talked about, depending on your source and the environmental conditions, all soils can have different levels of available nutrients. Of course, your primary source is going to be your mineral weathering of your rocks. But you also have secondary sources. And this is really critical, particularly in sites that have low mineralized weathering of your parent material. Soil organic matter decomposition and nutrient cycling is critical on those sites that you maintain that. So if you have a site from a, chemical, uh, from a climatic perspective that is, let's just say it's a warm, dry site. If it's warm and dry, little moisture inputs, your mineral weathering is going to be slower than it would be if it was had more moisture. So what's very important here is that a lot of those nutrients are going to be cycled from secondary sources. So as your organic matter decomposes, releases those nutrients back in the soil, that's where a lot of nutrition is going to be accessed by your plants. In your warm moist soils you have very fast nutrient cycling from your organic matter. So think of this out there in kind of your prairie lands, your grasslands where it's warm but it has enough moisture input. Your nutrient recycling from your grass species is rapid. It breaks down, it goes in, your microbes immediately access it, it breaks it down, it goes right into soil organic matter. If you go into colder systems, so higher elevation, or you go into drier systems at your lower elevation, 
that soil organic matter process slows down. So think of force at 4,500 feet of elevation. Sometimes you get that really thick duff layer built up, right? You get that what we call a force floor. So why is that force floor there? It's because your cycling, your organic matter cycling on that site is a lot slower. The temperature is slowing things down <coughs> on that site. So we have to keep all this in perspective as we go through our soil nutrition. So when we look at it from the primary source, we can look at our different rock types and the different kinds of minerals and we kind of come up with a weatherability index for these different minerals that make up these rock types. Because at the end of the day, these are the minerals where we get our nutrition. So we, remember we talked about basalts and granites and we talked about how our basalts were finer textured and our granites were coarser textured so you had sandier soils on granites and clay soils in basalts. Well, here's the reason why. Here is a, a microscopic view of the minerals within a granite rock and in a basalt rock. Look at the size difference. Now that's a fairly significant difference in size. When you have this many minerals within a particular rock, this has a lot of surface area. When you have a lot of surface area, this is going to break down into a finer textured soil. As you can imagine, this will break down into a sandier textured soil. That all goes into that whole thing about the amount of minerals that are available and its ability to hold water. So as we look at our different minerals that are rock, quartz, that's just glass, right? SO2, SiO2, silica. That's all that is is quartz. That's, that's, there's nothing in this mineral that a plant loves. It's just silica. The hardest rock to weather. You know, oftentimes you, know, you use quartz for cutting purposes and things like that. Quartz is one of the most hardest, surf, uh, hardest rock minerals to weather. And then we go through our kind of this is a range going from increase or from the lowest weatherability down to the highest weatherability. As we get into our igneous and metamorphic rocks, we get our feldspars, potassium, plagioclase is a sodium feldspar, Na. Uh, so that's just sodium feldspar. We have some micas. We have, and then we get into our uh, kind of basalt type rocks or igneous uh, basalt rocks, we get what they call pyroxene and olivine. Carbonates. This is actually something very critical we're going to talk about here in a minute when we get into our metasedimentary rocks. A lot of our metasedimentary rocks are made up of quartz, but many of our sedimentary rocks have carbonates in them. In fact, in this region, they have a lot. Think dolostone, uh, limestone. A lot of calcium, magnesium carbonates, calcium carbonates, anything with a CO3, which is carbonate, you mix that with magnesium or calcium, you get dull stone or limestone, which you have a lot of just going east here on I-90. And so they all weather to different degrees. So within these different minerals are what we call the elements. And the elements are the nutrients that our trees need, the plant essential nutrients. So the major elements in these rock types are oxygen, silica, aluminum, titanium, iron, uh, iron, manganese, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, phosphorus. We have some trace elements of nickel, copper, and zinc. And I color coded this to show them what, from a plant essential perspective, what is making up those different minerals. So if it's blue, these are our plant essential macronutrients. That means these are the nutrients our plants need the most of for cell building, for photosynthetic activity, for production, for growth. So that's going to be calcium, magnesium, potassium, and phosphorus. Our orange are plant essential micronutrients. So that would be your copper, zinc, iron, and manganese. Your black are often important, but they're not the critical nutrients that our trees need. So aluminum, titanium, nickel, sodium, Trace. Aluminum, though, actually, one of our foresters uh, back in the day called Grand Fur a, a nutrient hog. And actually, if you look at the aluminum content in Grand Fur, it is high. You know, we we're talking about a couple hundred pounds for some of those other nutrients earlier for nitrogen, and phosphorus, and calcium. Aluminum is much higher than all of that. It actually takes it up. But from a critical nutrient perspective, you don't need the aluminum like you do your other nutrients. 
And then red, I put a, a little unsmiley face next to the red. So what's red up there? Silica, right? Quartz. Bad stuff. Bad stuff. And this is why. The more silica you have, the less nutrients you have that that plant needs, right? So I've just picked three here, three different rock types, basalts, fine textured igneous, granites, coarse textured igneous, metasedimentary rocks, these are those metamorphosed, cooked, smushed sedimentary rocks that have been weathered, buried, cooked, smushed, uplifted, weathered, and released again. And so what happens is when you look on a whole rock geochemistry weight, so you just take a rock, regardless of the weight, what's the percent composition of these different kinds of mineral types? Quartz, so you look at basalt, all rocks are going to have silica in them. Yeah, that's just the basic building block of every rock. It's going to be silica. So you're always going to have silica. But if you look at basalts, about 52% of that rock is going to be silica. If you look at granitics, it's about 68%, 70% for your granitics. And you look at your metasedimentary rocks, well over 80% of that rock is just glass. So if anybody told you, oh, just plant your tree in a bunch of glass and it'll be fine, you would think that's kind of crazy, wouldn't you? Well, the trees think so too. And then here's some of the more critical nutrients as we go this way. So look at our basalts, high in iron, high in calcium, high in mag magnesium, and some trace amounts of potassium and sodium. Our granitics, not as high, but higher than your sedimentary in iron and calcium, magnesium, much higher in your potassium and some sodium. Why sodium and potassium? Remember there's two types of minerals I talked about, plagioclase feldspars and potassium feldspars. That's sodium and that's potassium. And that's why granitics are often higher in potassium and sodium because it has more of those two mineral types than basalts do. When we get into our metasedimentary, uh, metasedimentary rocks, deficient in iron, deficient in calcium, deficient comparatively relatively to all these others. And why are they less so? It's because, you know, big SI there, big psi. Big psi is taking on the majority of the rock type uh, mineral content in that, so in that uh, particular rock. So if you have more silica, you're going to have less of everything else. So getting this back to context, we are needing to classify sites, right, for our studies. You know, going back to, okay, how do we bin up sites? We can use habitat types like Pfister's Manual with forced habitat types. How can we bin up rock types so that we can say, okay, all rocks are going to have a different level of our nutrition, but, and we can't sample every rock type, right? We just can't. There's just no way you can. But can we bin these up so that we say, okay, these are typically high nutrition sites, these are moderate nutrition sites, and these are low nutrition sites. Well, looking at this kind of a factor here, silk content, that directly leads to weather building. So we can actually create a kind of a nutrient index or a rock index. And this we went back to some geology papers developed by Reich, Reich, Reiche back in 1940s. And essentially, this is what we call weathering potential index. And basically, it's a ratio of your kind of cations, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium. These are all elements that weather very easily from your rocks versus the sum of those divided by the sum of those, but we add on silica, aluminum, and iron, which are oftentimes the building blocks that are least weathered from the rocks. So essentially, the higher your WPI, the more weatherable that rock is. The lower that WPI, the less weatherable that is. So essentially, it's just a proportion of cations to all the other rock-forming minerals. And we all know that if you have a higher degree of these, it's going to weather more. So looking at those three same rock types again, like we showed in the geochemistry rock, what we found was within, say, our basalts, we had a fairly high weathering potential index. It had a range to it, somewhere between 16 and 29, but fairly consistent, a fairly high weather potential index. Granitics, 
you would expect would be a little lower. It has more silica, so you'd think it's going to weather a little bit less. But it had a range of 7 to 35, so actually while it was low compared to the basalt, there was some overlap. And the reason for that being is granitics can have varying levels of silica in them. There's a lot of different rock types that have different levels of silica. You can have anywhere from like 30% all the way up to 70% silica. So you have to know what kind of granite. There's a flavor of granites out there, and so that gives you a range. But when we looked at our sedimentary rock types, we thought, oh, those are going to be the worst from the WPI perspective. Well, look at the range we got on that, 1 to 75. So this would suggest that sometimes our metasedimentary rocks, remember I just got to saying, oh, metasedimentary rocks are the worst in the world. Well, now all of a sudden this would suggest, well, hold on a second. So when we start doing our analysis, it's just like, well, why then do we have that huge difference? Well, let's walk back through this a little bit. Metasedimentary rocks, where do they come from? Well, essentially, western Montana and northern Idaho, and stretching up into, up into Canada, was just a giant seabed at one time. You got these layers of sandstone, siltstone, claystone, sandstone, siltstone, claystone. It got buried, smushed, and then uplifted and turned. So sometimes when you're going down the highway, you see these bands of purple and green a lot in this region. Well, and sometimes they're, they're oriented you know, this way, and sometimes they're kind of oriented up this way. Well, that's all that metamorphic activity, and that's all those different beds of sediments that have buried and cooked and uplifted. And those reds and greens are different because the oxygen content in those soils was different. So when you had the redder color, they're more iron rich because if it's, it was oxygenated. If it was green, it was oxygen depleted, so it's what they call an anaerobic environment. And when it was anaerobic, you get a lot of this more manganese, and it gets greener color, and so you get this different kind of color texture just depending on you know, the oxygen content that was in those beds when they were buried. So essentially what we do is we have this, but what was the degree of calcium and magnesium in the sediment deposits? What was the amount of silica in those deposits? And so what we found out was within this, what we call the belt group metasediment. So this is named after Belt Montana, because that's when the geologists were first going through and doing their geology surveys, and they ran into these metasedimentary rocks was around Belt Montana. And so they're called the belt supergroup of metasedimentary. But here's all these flavors. We call them flavors of metasediments. And the reason why we call them flavors is because what was the texture of the material that was buried? What was the, uh, the um, chemistry of that material that was buried? They all had different kinds of makeups that way. And so this striped peak carbonate, Remember we said a 1 for a weatherability index up to 75? Well here we have a, what we call a striped peak carbonate and all the way over here is just a striped peak without carbonate. Look at the difference in our WPI, which is our blue bar, and our silica content, which is the red bar. Huge difference. Well it just so happens in this striped peak metasedimentary rock type, even though it's a quartzite, it's dominated by carbonate materials. So you could have the silica content in there, but if you have this carbonate, what happens? When you're on a striped peak carbonate, that soil weathers deeply. You get a very deep weathered soil. And you compare it to its mate over here without carbonate, it won't hardly form a soil profile at all. Now, from a nutrition perspective, I heard something about Rivoli. Well, I've, yeah. There you have, yeah. That's what we have. You got Revali. <laughs> you got Revali. So where you're, where are you at? You're over here. You're almost on the worst end of the spectrum. Yeah. So, for us over in Idaho, it's Stripe Peak, and we have very little Stripe Peak carbonates. <laughs> We're sitting down here with you guys. When you're driving from a forestry perspective, now that you brought that up, what do you see 
I'll be curious what you see over here on the Revali, see if it matches up what we get on the Strike Peak. But when you compare a forest growing over here on your Revali group versus, say, something growing on a basalt or a granitic rock type, what do you see from a health perspective, from a kind of a you know, productivity perspective? Not good. <laughs> yeah. And the reason for that is, look at that quartz content, the SiO2 content. It has a lot of silica, it's got a lot of glass, it has very poor nutrition, it has very low water holding capacity, it forms a very shallow soil. So what happens when you get in this lower elevation sites where moisture content is low? They're just, just going to go, I'm not feeling too perky. So they're not going to do much. You could throw fertilizer out the galore on these sites, and it might help it a little bit if you got a lot of, in fact, if you have the right moisture regime, you could fertilize these sites and they'd be very happy. But there's two things to remember on this site. I don't know about your Rivoli sites, but our Stripe Peak sites typically have a lot of root rot activity, a lot of insect and disease activity. Why? Those trees are stressed. They're going to be susceptible to your root rots. They're going to be susceptible to insects and disease. So what happens when you say, I'm just going to put nitrogen out there? So I'm going to ask you a question. What happens when you go out on a site that's stressed? Say there's armillaria root rot out there. And you go out there and you put nitrogen out there. What do you think is going to happen? Is that? What's going to happen to the trees? You're going to kill them. You're going to kill them. Because you're feeding, not only are you giving the tree food, but you're putting more sugar content in those trees. But basically, you're just creating the McDonald's drive-in for your root rots and your insects and disease activity. Because it's just, it's just like eating a chocolate candy bar for those root rots. <coughs> They're just going to go crazy in those kinds of stands. So what happens when you do that? That's where you start having to kick in your potassium and your sulfur and your boron and maybe even some copper into those particular stands. If you want to fertilize, it's not that you can't fertilize them, but you have to have a lot of caution when you fertilize it because number one, you're going to have to have adequate moisture and number two is you can't fertilize with just nitrogen or you're going to kill it. You'll grow wonderful root rots and great disease pockets, but... Um, that already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what we have to tell, you know, let's go back to this map here. Look at the spread of these rock types in this region. This is one of the major rock types we have in this region that we have to be really considered about when we do any kind of management that's going to have an effect on nutrition or we want to do fertilization on. Because depending on that kind of rock type, if you're in the Revali and the Striped Group, Striped Peak Group, you have to be very careful with what you do from a management perspective. Do you have some yeah. examples of, of locations that are on the other side that are better, like the Stripe Peak? Yeah, so when we get into the Wallace, when we're more in these, what well, we call, now calc silicate, I, yeah, I was going to move on a little too rapidly. So I was talking about carbonates. There's also these rocks that we call calc silicates. So they're silica bearing minerals, but they have a calcium matrix to them. So unlike CO3, which is carbonate, which weathers really well, as you can imagine, a calc silicate is not going to weather as much, but it's going to weather more so than it's made without calc silicates. And it's just that calcium will dissolve and allow the minerals to break apart and form a deeper soil. So when we get more into our carbonates, our calc silicate rock types over here for these different flavors, they're a lot more forgiving for your, from a forest management perspective. So on these kind of rock types, you won't see the forest health issues that you see down here for your striped peak and Rivoli group. Now, you will probably have more so than what you'd have on a basalt rock type, granted that. But within these flavors here, if you're on this carbonate calc silicate end, you're going to have less issues than if you're down here on your syringas, striped peaks, and Rivolis without them. So one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at your geology maps, you want to di differentiate those two. Does that answer the question? Yeah. So based on this, we can come up with rock type rankings. There's nutrient status, 
Particle size, this is critical for nutrient retention and water holding capacity and a soil nutrient status. So essentially at the very top of that list is our basalts. Basalts are the best growing soil that you can put a tree into, granted you have the climatic regime. Where the problem comes in with basalts is where basalts often happen in a forest environment. Where do you often you see the basalt soils? Lower elevation, right? Very rare you see basalt soils at 3,500, 4,000, 4,500 feet where you have higher elevation which leads to cooler temperatures, which leads to more annual precipitation. So a lot of our basalt soils, while from a water holding perspective, from a soil nutrient perspective, from rock nutrient status are very good, a lot of them sit at the lower elevations. So more of your pine, your dug fir types. So typically, even though you might have a, a forest growing on basalts, it actually might be less productive than some of your stands growing on these poorer rock types at higher elevation because of what? Moisture. Moisture, moisture, moisture. It all gets back to moisture. So you have to keep that in mind. But from that perspective, basalts and the granites tend to be on the higher end. Granitics can get to the low side if it has that higher degree of silica content. That's something, you know, a lot of your rock maps, you can get into the manuals or the PDFs that come with your rock maps, <clears throat> and it will be able to define what that silica content, I'll tell you what the primary is, is it a granodiorite, is it a tonalite, is it a granitic, is it a granodiorite, is it a quartz diorite? You know, when it says quartz diorite, what's quartz? <clears throat> SO2. And if that's SiO2, it's going to have much higher quartz content, much higher silica content, so that's what's going to be thrown in sometimes down here. So then we go through our metamorphic, which tend to be in our middle zone. We've just taken this mixed category, which is our surficial deposits and glacial, and we just dumped it into the variable category because it's just a mixed bag. It's whatever source those particular minerals, it's a site-by-site -site basis when it comes into the glacial. Typically in our sedimentary rock types, this would be our shales, our sandstones, even our limestones and dolomites. They're medium to low as far as their status. In fact, you go east of town. What's those uh, mountains east of town here? What are those called? Um, where's that? The mill where you go on? Is it Highway 200 going out towards Lubrick? If you go out that way, and there's some, I know there's a mountain range you can. If you take I-90 and you climb up and over, like you're going to go to Lubrick, there's a mountain, little kind of group of mountains in there. I'm not, I, not from this region as much, so I don't know the names of those. Okay. Is that Garnet? Garnets. In the Garnets, there's a lot of this limestone out in that neck of the woods. And it can weather a little bit, but what happens in those limestones? Those limestones dry out. Those, those stands on those limestones, they actually have, they can hold the water, but they just don't release it just like a big sponge and then the trees just can't suck it out. So, and it, while it has, maybe if it's a limestone, it's got the calcium in it. If it's a dol dolomite, it might have magnesium in it. Again, it's a sedimentary rock that has been weathered from other mi minerals and uh, materials. So it's not gonna have a lot in it from a nutrition perspective. So a lot of our sedimentaries are on our lower status. So, Let's just kind of summarize this then. So the source of most of our macro and micronutrients is the soil, no surprise. We get minor inputs of nitrogen and sulfur from the atmosphere, and since we get very minimal amounts of it, this is the most limiting nutrients. These are two of the most limiting nutrients in our area. A lot of the geology in this region is very young, as opposed to other areas that have gone under considerable weathering for a long time longer time. So a lot of this material has been just recently uplifted geologic time-wise. And so that's going to have an impact on our soil development. So if we have young soils, that means oftentimes we're going to have shallower soils, coarser textured, a lot higher coarse fragment soils, which all has a play to how much nutrition is available. Um, 
These are major rock types that dominate this area for you guys. A lot of it's going to be metasedimentary or sedimentary, and your valleys are going to be a lot more of your glacials or your lacustrines. Nutrient richness, salts are on the top end, metasediments are on the poor end. With our basalts and granites too, we can be on one basalt in one part of the region and a basalt in another part of the region in a different part of the region, and they're fairly typically the same. You have different flows of basalts, but typically your nutrition and your mineralogy and your physical characteristics for basalts and granites are fairly consistent. Not so with your metasets, and that's what really creates a challenge is what flavor of metaset are you on? And that's going to be critical to know. <coughs> because that's going to affect your weathering. So this is the most critical part. And we've been talking about this. And I just want to hit this home is understanding what the silica content is. Because the more silica content, the more, uh, the less of the other nutrients are present, the less weathering it will have, the more coarse texture it will be, and the less the plants are going to grow from a productive and healthy perspective. Yes. Yeah, on the, the grass, I don't trouble with that too, but on the areas that have low mineral content. Yes. How does it work out how is it tons per acre? That's a good question and one that I don't have a slide to really get you that graphic. But let's just say that if you had 80% silica, from a soils perspective, we can work that up into a pounds per acre because an acre for a slice is what, two million pounds to the acre? Something like that. So multiply that by 80%. So that's a lot of silica. An acre for a slice is what, six inches if I remember correct? Six and a half, six and a half inches, yeah. So when you have something in percent, if you have a volume weight value in air, by area, you can just multiply those percentages by that and that will give you that value. So, so here, <clears throat> calcium, iron, let's just take iron. Iron was 11.5%. So you can just multiply, you know, that acre furrow slice times that percentage and that will give you how much iron on a, on a percent basis that way. Just trying to mentally calculate what's available compared to what you'd be apl applying with prescribed fertilization. Exactly right. So when it comes down to these minerals, this is why we often tell people do not even worry about fertilizing with some of these. And the reason for that being is, is from an availability perspective, there's actually quite a bit of these primary minerals. Our nitrogen, if I remember correctly, the last measurements they've done, the inputs of nitrogen into our soil systems on an annual basis. No, that was in kilograms per hectare, but usually kilograms per hectare is one for one for acres, uh, pounds per acre. So if I remember right, it was somewhere around two to four pounds per acre per year, nitrogen inputs into our soils. So when you think of that from a two to four pounds and what plants actually need to see, when you see a response, it's you're, we're typically recommending 200 pounds of nitrogen to the acre. Not per year, it's typically a one-time uh, fertilization. We'll get to that actually towards the end of this talk a little bit more. But you can see that the nitrogen inputs, if we're seeing deficiencies in the foliage and you're only getting about two to four pounds of nitrogen input a year, you can imagine the deficiencies that you have to overcome. And typically we see that deficiency overcome when you get around 200 pounds of nitrogen to the acre. So when it comes to surficial soils, while there's a lot of different kinds that we could talk about, there's lacustrian, there's alluvium, they temp typically tend to be more geographically isolated as compared to our volcanic ash soils. And what time was I supposed to go till today? <laughs> Holy mackerel. <laughs> It's already 10.20. Oh, shoot. Okay. <laughs> I've been having too much fun. I've got, like, way too many slides. So, um, 
But I do want to go over volcanic ash because volcanic ash is one of those constituents in our forest soils that is critical. In fact, in many of our areas, we wouldn't have the forest types we have if it wasn't for volcanic ash. So definition really quick of volcanic ash is it's a soil influenced by or formed in a wind deposited um, fine textured volcanic tephra. So just think of all those Cascade Mountains, they erupt, that fine volcanic material is transported by wind and deposited. You can have different size classes, your ash is less than two millimeters, your pumice is your, um, greater than two millimeters in size. Your pumice is what you'd see closer to the source of the volcano volcanoes, your ash is what we would get over here. Classification terminology, vitrandic is less than seven inches, andic, and this is if you get into like the NRCS manuals and you start looking at classification of soils, you'll see this vitrandic, andic, and andesol, and essentially it's kind of some of the chemical properties, but also we often use just a depth to classify it. So vitranic is your mixed to less than seven inches, your antic soils are your seven to 14, your anisols are greater than 14 inches. And if you look here, here's a classic case of a volcanic ash. In Idaho, we get a lot redder volcanic ash. If you're over in Libya, Montana, you'll get that redder ash. If you get further east, it gets more of kind of a grayer, tanner color, and that's because less moisture, more of a continental climate. When you get in a continental climate, you get less moisture, you get less moisture. This red is from iron. Iron is being released as those minerals weather in the volcanic ash, which gives it that red tint. So when you get in the drier atmosphere or a drier types over here, you'll get a little less of that red color. Where did it come from? Well, you know, we have our whole Cascade Crest. All of them have been repeat, repeat offenders of volcanic eruptions with Mount, Mount St. Helens being the most so. However, Crater Lake here, which doesn't even show within the kind of recorded time history back to about 4,000 years ago, it doesn't even show. But Crater Lake is actually the one that has defined our forest to a degree that really nothing else has in that period of time. So Crater Lake was the largest known eruption um, known in the Cascade Range, about 5,800 years BC. BC. They estimate the eruptive, eruptive column reached about 10 miles in the atmosphere at two times speed of sound, so about Mach 2. Essentially, they estimate it was a little taller than Mount Rainier in Washington State. And to this day, it's only about 8,000 feet. Where Rainier is what, 12, 12-ish? Somewhere around 12. So it lost about three to 4,000 feet of its dome. If you've driven down, if you've all been there, you've driven, you've seen those big kind of massive mud flows. They call them mud flows. There's these huge banks of, of uh, pumice. And essentially those are just mud flows that came out of the side. They call it a circular ring eruption. And that's why it's just almost like a perfect ring. It basically, it just exploded out sideways. Circular ring right around. And essentially it produced about 30 cubic miles of airfall material. Now, to put that in perspective, if you took that 30 cubic miles, it covered the entire state of Montana with a foot of volcanic material. So that's a lot of material, right? That's a lot of material. So here's kind of the uh, perspective of its deposition zone. So Mount St. Helens, we've all been around, we kind of remember Mount St. Helens back in 1980s. So this was essentially its, you know, its visible deposition zone. This is where appreciable amounts of, of ash from Mount St. Helens was deposited. As opposed to Crater Lake, when it blew, it went all the way up into BC, Alberta, all the way over here to Montana, Wyoming, all the way down to Nevada and Utah, California. Um, this is where appreciable amounts of volcanic material, of course, it, they actually estimate this went all the way around the world uh, in the jet stream, but this is where we got our volcanic ash from. So to this day, a lot of this material, a lot of this material up here from the other volcanic materials, but this color is the darker the color, the more ash influence on that site. So your really dark colors are your deeper ash cap soils. Your lighter colors are less so. Here's Montana. We have a good chunk of volcanic ash over in this particular region. Sometimes you'll get these two different looks. You'll get what we call andic or vit vitrantic intergrades. It's kind of more mixed in with the soil. It's harder to see you get our nice ash caps. What was really critical about this is its properties. The properties of volcanic ash are so unique, they impart a different characteristic to the soil than is typically there. I'm not going to go through all of this, but what I want you to see is some of our, the mineralogy is that the texture is very fine, 
mineralogically, a lot of surface area. Surface area is going to be very important. It's made up of a lot of glass particles. Now I said silica is bad, right? In this case, volcanic ash has a lot of silica in it. In this case, this actually is what gives a lot of our ash caps high water holding capacity. Look at all the little surface areas, little holes that make up that glass particle. Glass makes up 35% of that ash cap surface. Now, from a silica perspective, that's bad. But from a water holding capacity, it's huge. I'm going to skip that one. Look at this glacial till soil. Here's a volcanic ash soil sitting on top of it. And we look at, here's the break between the two. We come over here. This is water, plant available water. Look what happens here. We get 20, 30, up to almost 40% plant available water in our ash cap down to 10% in our glacial till soil. So what does that mean from a plant community and a plant health and a plant productivity perspective? If this soil can hold that much more water, you can imagine your plant types on that site. Actually, a lot of our forests in this region, we wouldn't have cedar hemlock types if it wasn't for volcanic ash. In fact, a lot of, there's a lot of consideration that a lot of our forests that were dug for grand fir are now cedar hemlock types. A lot of sites that were grasslands became pine dug fir types just because of the effect of this water holding capacity on the site. It is huge because what does volcanic ash do for you? Not only have, do we see this influence on plant communities, so here we got our pine dug fir types down here. Up here we have our cedar hemlocks which are represented by our deeper ash caps. But what this does is it prolongs the growing period. If a plant has water, it can grow longer. If a plant doesn't have that water, it's going to shut down sooner. And so this volcanic ash allows that soil to hold the water longer, reducing drought stress. Drought stress is critical to, if we can overcome drought stress, this is what volcanic ash does. It holds that water provides a suitable moisture regime for your either shade tolerant species or water demanding species or it gives you the output that you need to say fertilize. A lot of our forest stands you wouldn't want to for, for say we have a metased without, vol, without volcanic ash and we had a metased with volcanic ash. You could actually fertilize a volcanic ash metased soil that you would not want to fertilize if it was just straight metasedimentary parameter, and the reason for that is a lot of it has to do with water. So I've got, oh shoot, <laughs> um, darn, let me just get into something real quick. So growth rate, mixed conifer growth rate with and without ash cap, ash cap 30% increase on our stands with volcanic ash without fertilization. Ash caps, you apply nitrogen, 50% increase in growth rate just by having a volcanic ash versus a non-volcanic ash. This is just a spaghetti map, but what essentially what it's showing is, is we would get on these different, this is our, our species, um, dug for, this would be our dry sites, wet, cedars would be our wet sites, and essentially what this is showing is, is typically if we apply nitrogen, we're going to see a response on any kind of rock by species. Optimal being around two to three hundred pounds of nitrogen to the acre is where we see up to thirty to seventy percent response to nitrogen fertilization in our stands. And this makes sense. Remember we go back to that cumulative distribution curve that showed nitrogen is the most efficient soil out there. Well, if you see this kind of response to nitrogen, it's going to increase. Why, are, why is it dipping down when we start putting more nitrogen out there? What's going on is we're getting more mortality on these sites. What happened because we have more mortality? It was because of what? It was we were fertilizing insects and disease. So there's, we're not going to get to the other graphic, but if you fertilized with nitrogen and sulfur or some other micronutrient that helps you overcome this, you don't get that um, effect as much. Really quick, points to consider. Why are you choosing to fertilize? Is it forest health, you know, is it forest health or productivity? 
If it's forest health, really consider other nutrients to add other than just nitrogen. If it's for productivity, think of rock types. Think of what you want to put on there to make sure you don't kill your trees because you're fertilizing the insects and the disease on site. What is your moisture regime? You need to have water. If you don't have water, don't even think of fertilization. We did a lot of uh, fertilization trials just out by the Lubrick site on some pine dug fir types. That much response. Why? You just don't have the moisture, right? You just don't have water. Rule of thumb, you need about 25 to 30 inches of annual precip year to actually see a response. What is the age of composition? If you got an old stand, don't fertilize it. There's no point in it. It's old. It's not going to respond. So typically your younger stands and your more your climax species are going to respond to your fertilization. Makes sense. So your younger, your older stands or your more uh, cereal species. Cereal species are very conservative with their nutrients and with the water. So they're not going to, you can't jazz them up, so to speak. You've got to keep uh, that in mind when you think about, you know, what, what your primary purpose is and also what the composition and age of your stand is. Root rots, bug infestations. Now, if we have a lot of uh, uh, disease out there, particularly root rots, it can significantly increase your mortality. So you've got to keep that in your mind. The other thing, too, is baseline growth rate. If you're on a site that has low growth, you might increase growth rate 70% over baseline, but what's 70% of nothing? 70% of nothing is still nothing, right? <laughs> so what's, there's a point of how long are you going to carry your fertilization costs? Because if you have a low growth rate, you fertilize it, and you want to get a return on your investment, you may never see it. So on some sites, if you have to fertilize, it might be more of just trying to maintain forest health so you're not fertilizing with nitrogen. You're fertilizing with something else to just kind of keep the forest health. But from a productivity perspective, and if you want to ramp up your harvest, you've got to make sure that you can get a return on your investment, which means is if you're fertilizing for productivity, you should probably harvest within 10 to 15 years because most of your fertilization effect wears off after about 10 years. You've got that burst of growth over that 10 years that you won't have if you didn't fertilize, but that growth rate goes back to what it was before you fertilized. You've got that amount of basal area that you increase in volume over that 10 year window, but then, off, then it goes back to the natural system. So typically you want to harvest so you don't carry those costs too long. And then you need a rule of thumb too is you need about 20% growth response to actually get a, a meaningful ROI or return on your investment. And the reason for this is there's a lot of costs that go in. There's carrying costs of your fertilizer, the cost of your fertilizer. What happens if you put that money in the bank and just let it grow? You know, in today's world, you actually you might as well fertilize, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and the way the oil prices are going, nitrogen prices are going down. Nitrogen used to be really expensive because they made urea from what? Petrol. You know? And so when the price of oil was through the roof, everybody stopped fertilizing because the urea prices just went up. In this case, um, it's getting more and more uh, doable. So summary, region-wide, you know, there's region-wide end limitations. Growth response to fertilization, you can get more than 40%. Dry spites, don't even think about it. You know, most sites will respond to a um, nitrogen, sulfur, and boron. You have to keep that in mind when you're looking at different kind of rock types. You know, parent material has important controls. You know, water holding capacity, nutrient richness, and you want me to break? I just have a couple more slides. You guys want to hang in for the last couple slides? You want to break? I'm just going to talk about some best management practices here, real quick. Okay. So, one thing to consider is. How does our management affect our nutrient stocks? We've kind of talked about this a little bit, but I just want to put this in the framework of a couple of graphics. So let's just say we have some degree of nutrient stock up here. And here's time. So we start out, we do our harvest. On a particular site with that base, you do a longer rotation, there's going to be a point where that site nutrient stock will get back to what it was. Because what? When you're taking the top off, 
Essentially, all those trees, all that plant biomass has what? It's mine. They're miners, right? They're mining. They're mining nutrients off that site. So over a certain length of time on that, a particular site, it will get back to what it was. You can harvest it over a certain amount of length of time. It'll get back to where it was. And you'll have no effect on site nutrient stock. So sustainable, right? On a particular site, if you have a shorter rotation, and you keep doing short rotations, it will never be able to recover back. So knowing what this stock availability is will allow you, if the site has a lot of silica, not a lot of nutrients, it's a drier site type, can you imagine what would happen is if you tried to do a lot of short rotations on a site with a poor nutrient status and a poor replacement rate? You have the potential of taking a poor site and making it poor as opposed to a site with a lot of nutrients. A lot of nutrients and a lot of moisture, you could probably do short rotations and never have an impact because your replacement rate's high and your moisture climate's high, so you can actually have a longer rotation. Intensity of utilization, okay, the same kind of site. Let's just say we do whole tree versus bowl only. So on one site, you're just taking the stem off and you're leaving the tops and the limbs and the, um, kind of maybe some of the bark, whatever you're leaving on a particular site. If you have a site with a particular nutrient stock, if you do bull only harvesting, if you're leaving, because a lot of those nutrients are tied up where? It's not often in the bowl, it's in that foliage. It's in the fine branches. A lot of your nitrogen, your potassium, your sulfur, your boron, a lot of that's held in the finer tissues. So if you delim in the woods, you leave the tops in the woods, Actually, it will recover quite rapidly. If you pull this all off with a whole harvesting perspective, and that site has a poor nutrient status, you have the potential to degrade that site. Look at a nutrition replacement rate. So we're talking about how rapid the nutrients turn over and weather in, 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 on that particular site. If we do a harvest, if we have a site that has a moisture regime and a, and a mineralization regime on a particular rock that's low in silica, the replacement rate for those nutrients are going to be quite high. So if you have a lot of organic inputs that are this is a warm, moist site with a, a soil paramaterial with a lot of nutrients, you know, it's going to have a rapid replacement rate. As opposed to if you had a site high in silica, it was warm, it was dry, your soil nutrient replacement, not only are you going to have lower organic matter inputs going in the system, you're going to have a slow replacement rate. So if you take more material off, you have the ability to, re to actually degrade the site. So you put all three together, you can actually kind of come up with a, your own dichotomous key on management in a way. So let's say you have a warm, moist climate, organic matter inputs are high, mineralization rates are high, you could do short rotations, you could probably do whole tree harvesting, and you probably wouldn't have to worry about you're depleting nutrients on that site because the inputs were rapid. So you can say, okay, on those particular sites where I have a high replacement rate, I can have a whole tree harvesting on a short rotation. As opposed to Rivalis or Striped Peaks, if we went in and did a short rotation with whole tree harvesting with a slow replacement rate, what's going to happen to that site? It'll go to a grass or a shrub field, right? You won't have anything left on that site. In fact, in our area in North Idaho, there are some sites where they harvested 20, 30 years ago, still grass fields. They have never got those sites back to forest. And it, when they caught them, they were these old kind of decadent grand fir, dug fir. The grand fir was falling apart with scolitis and root rot. Dug fir and pine were kind of hanging in there. They took the tops off. They can't even get pine to grow. It's a harsh site. So you got to be really crit. You got to be really cognizant of your site types. So take-home points: silviculture prescriptions can degrade or enhance long-term productivity. So you just have to be aware of your soil site environment. It's critical. Understand how that climate and soil status could affect the sustainability of your prescriptions. You know, every site's different. You got to manage site by site. That's all all we can do and so being aware of that is you know we only have one soil to work with so we better use it to the best of our ability so with that I kind of went over but that was fun I appreciate your
Thanks again. Thank you. I have a question.